Uh, so it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you all today. It's a, a special treat to uh, be with Tom and Tava, um, who, who are re remarkable people. And I, I am inspired and encouraged uh, by both of them. And together with the three T's, we're, you know, bringing you, you know, Terry, Tom, Tava. And uh, hopefully you'll find that experience worthwhile. I had the wonderful opportunity during my last five years of work, and, I, and, and as, uh, as was said, I, I, I have recently retired, though I have a good friend that called it, he didn't think I retired, I repurposed, because I'm staying engaged uh, with lots of things in the community, uh, things like this, and, and still very interested in micro-housing and see that moving forward. I had the opportunity during my last five years to have these roles with the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs and the Coalition in Homelessness. I was essentially embedded in the department and it brought together this kind of best of both worlds, a nonprofit that had the expertise and experience with homelessness with a state department that had a platform, had resources, and we were able to make some good progress toward ending veteran homelessness. And so when I was hired, the first thing we did was work to form an Operation Home Task Force that was state leaders uh, that begin to look at places in the state where we might be able to make a difference in ending veteran homelessness. Uh, we had a number of activities we did, including getting together transitional housing providers to coordinate their services. We hired, a, uh, found money and hired a group to come in and train folks. Uh, it was called Rapid Results, and we had six communities of teens that we brought to Raleigh and trained, and then they went back into their communities and over a 100-day period using these kind of methodologies were able to house 263 homeless veterans in the permanent housing within 100 days. Started a landlord incentive program, which was is still going on with the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency that looked at uh, incentivizing landlords to rent to people moving out of homelessness with uh, highlighting uh, those being veterans. Uh, made some good progress on that. Those incentives were, did things like help cover the cost of if an apartment got destroyed or even bonus payments or uh, money paid to help encourage the landlord to rent to people that they might ordinarily not. Um, so through the, all these efforts uh, that we were able to put together, along with uh, increased federal funding and a, and a national emphasis on really stepping up to the challenge of meaning veteran homelessness, we were able to show uh, a 28% decrease from 2011 that had started in 2011 and slowly came down through the years uh, to 904 uh, in, in uh, last year. I, I don't have the current uh, numbers uh, uh, for what that is yet this year, uh, but hopefully it has continued that downward trend despite a slight uptick in that year that you see a 4% increase. We continued on on the basis of that and began addressing some different things, veterans who were coming out of prison without sufficient housing, uh, working to rally folks from around the state by engaging the governor at one of our statewide uh, uh, summits and having a press conference and then looking at rural homelessness among veterans where the numbers aren't as concentrated as you have in the urban areas, but it's also more difficult to get the services. So we've been to look at that. And we also started examining, which is why I'm here with y'all today, micro housing uh, uh, for veterans, uh, particularly looking at villages. So as we researched it, we found that there were some assets to microhousing that, and when I use the word microhousing, it's often tiny homes is often mentioned or small houses. Uh, we like the term microhousing because I thought it had more dignity, especially for veterans than tiny homes. Uh, and, and so a lot of times there are things going on around the country where people are doing temporary housing uh, for homeless folks, you know, that is get, getting them up off the street and where there's that, that may have some value. That was not our emphasis. Our emphasis was how do we create housing that could be permanent, sustainable uh, for veterans, but would, ju would just be much smaller. 
And so it's good to remember that these are first and foremost homes. They can be a, a good part of a larger response around the need for affordable housing and addressing the housing needs of veterans and folks who are experiencing homelessness. We begin to find out as we looked at things that it was affordable, uh, that, that it, the cost that it took uh, was within the range of other affordable housing. And you don't, you still have to, you still have to have all the infrastructure, you still have to have all the things. It's just a smaller footprint. So if you were to get savings, it's on how many uh, homes that you could get per lot, not necessarily on the square footage cost itself. Um, we thought, uh, we saw what it, it was being uh, presented as an alternative uh, to lower quality mobile homes that are especially true in rural areas and can provide housing uh, uh, that might fill some of that gap. We also saw micro housing as having an asset that uh, it, for people who wanted to be in their own homes versus sharing walls as well. Uh, so as mentioned in the introduction, I, I spent 22 years as founder director of housing for New Hope, and we uh, built, developed and built affordable housing. They were apartments for people moving out of homelessness. And those are very good. And you can get more of those per square acre than you can a home. Nevertheless, there is inherent value in having your own home as compared to an apartment. Uh, and it's our, it was, became our belief that we needed a mix of these. This would be a good mix. And last I'll mention is that it incorporates universal design. Uh, so it's accessible to all people, uh, whatever their age or whether they have a disability level, which was part of what uh, drew us uh, uh, to the, the College of Design that Tom is going to talk about here shortly. So one of the things that I did is, is uh, as was mentioned, I am an adjunct instructor at the Sanford School of Public Policy. And another instructor there, Tom Allen, was teaching a course in what's called human-centered design. When you're looking and examining a project or a system, you first of all consult with those who use the system, uh, which makes common sense, right? <laughs> Uh, but we don't I often don't follow that common sense approach that sometimes we will identify on the left hand side our goals and create concepts and then fit those concepts to who we're trying to serve. Whereas human centered design, like it sounds like, is first of all understand uh, the people it's seeking to serve, then create concepts and then build operational systems that evolve from your understanding of who's being served. And so we put together a team uh, that included some of my students and some of his uh, to do a project where over the course of the summer, they interviewed 25 uh, either currently or formerly veterans, uh, formerly homeless veterans, as well as people who were working in the field of veteran homelessness to ask them questions, open-ended questions about what they would like to see in design of a, of a micro house or, or housing that would best suit their needs. And so there were some uh, key insights which are not showing up there. There we go. So first of all is that home is a place to regain their pride. So there was a sense of value uh, uh, that you lose when you're, when you're uh, experiencing homelessness. And so the key insight that derives from as we use this model is that home is a personalized reflection of self. The second, this transition from military to civilian world is difficult. And, it, and even though, because when people in the military, a lot of times they've gone straight out of high school into the military, uh, where the decisions are made from them, when, when they eat, what they eat, when they have leave, when they go to bed, when they get up, et cetera, and it can be very difficult. So, and, and, and there's a sense as that difficulty is coming in that you can lose you without those structure, you can kind of lose your sense of purposefulness and, and can have feelings of isolation. So the last is that uh, home home is a place, let me see if I, I can't quite see it on my screen there. Oh, here we go. Uh, home is a place to get away, but still be part of a community. So as I mentioned before, not everyone likes that sharing of walls and there is a value in having your own space. Uh, and so the insight that comes to that is that there was a need for veterans, especially to live, uh, uh, both have, 
uh, their own space and privacy, but in context of a community where they're surrounded by people who understand them and, and, and uh, understand what they've been through uh, and what challenges they have now and working with. There was a lot of emphasis on just it, it just simple. It doesn't have to be big, just has to be simple. And so the, the, the uh, team actually had people draw what they uh, wanted their unit to look like. Um, there were some just basic elements, uh, key structural elements around storage, around things being tidy, uh, and, and, the, and important to, that space helps you reclaim that sense of pride in yourself and how you're living, all these things which have been impacted by their experience in homelessness. And then there were many other details that are common to all housing, wanting uh, to make sure that uh, that sound they're soundproofed and you have that sense not only of visual but sound privacy and then just various creature comforts that are listed there i'll mention a couple that were key yard or space around the unit so you you had you you might have a small space but there's sort of uh, some wideness of space and what surrounds you um, as well as access to medical care grocery store and a church and that it needed some type of multi-purpose room or community center so you can develop a sense of community there where participation is welcome and encouraged just in the design and layout, but it's not required uh, for you to, have, to live there. And so with those insights that the students had garnered, in the meantime, I was having extended conversations with Tom uh, at NC uh, School of Design and I had those students come over and actually present to his class, which by that time it started. So I was fortunate to be able to uh, obtain some funding from various builders actually that, that I've known through the years and, and able to contract with NC State to undertake this study, this class. And, and the charge that we handed off to them was help us come up with some designs uh, that, that would reflect what homeless veterans experiencing homeless homelessness including those who are disabled are facing that would promote a sense of dignity and self-respect that would have the kind of layout that would in, that would honor the need for privacy and also the desire for community and so with that i'll hand it off to tom to continue Okay, thanks, Terry. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so as Terry mentioned, this was a, uh, you know, a partnership. The North Carolina Coalition and Homelessness and uh, Initiative at the School of Architecture at NC State. You know, a collaborative, we call it a collaborative research and design uh, project. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Initiative. We bring resources, we bring the resources of a research intensive university to the housing challenges North Carolina faces uh, and educate students about the social mission of the built environment. In this project, 11 graduate students conducted research on veteran homelessness and support services, documented precedents and best practices of micro house villages, and designed prototypical micro house villages for sites in Durham, Raleigh and Wendell, uh, three different ones, uh, given that part of Terry's charge was to design uh, prototypes that could be applied statewide. Uh, I also formed an advisory committee of local housing providers and advocates, and we brought in a couple of outside experts in micro housing projects. The result was a uh, project report that is a playbook for designing micro house villages statewide and a video for educational and fundraising uh, efforts, uh, which I will end my talk with. So, micro houses, uh, Terry already outlined, uh, I think, very, uh, uh, very well. You know what a micro house actually is. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history 
uh, and we like to do this to say, you know, we're not just dreaming this up. Micro houses, as Terry mentioned, are small, complete single dwellings. They usually range from around 150 to 400 square feet. And micro house villages are just what they sound like, a grouping of these homes on a single property, uh, uh, but also with, uh, you know, a common house, sometimes with supportive services and so forth, depending on the, uh, the resident profile. Proponents of micro houses uh, uh, include Jay Schaefer. He's, he's like the guru of the tiny house uh, movement and founder of Tumbleweed Houses. And uh, he and others position them, them as to the economic burdens. And they've also been proposed nationwide as a model for affordable housing and a solution to homelessness. Microhouse is not a new idea. For most of human history, the majority of families lived in what would now be considered a tiny home. Perhaps the most famous micro house is Henry David Thoreau's 150 square foot self built cabin on Walden Pond in Concord, Mass., there on the upper right, in which Thoreau carefully documented his building process to argue that by uh, only providing for basic needs, the cabin freed him to pursue what he viewed as the most important things in life. Much like microhouses, microhouse villages are also not a new concept. An early example uh, dating from the early 1800s uh, was, is the Methodist summer camp community on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, shown in the lower slide there. A summer revival camp that evolved into small wooden cottages clustered around courtyards, one with a magnificent, what they call a tabernacle. In the early 1900s, Southern California bungalow courts, shown on the upper left there, featured clusters of small homes surrounding internal courtyards. More recently, organizations across the country have created microhouse villages to serve homeless populations. Our students did a lot of research. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. This is the cottages of Hickory Crossing. It was built in Dallas in 2014 to serve chronically homeless individuals with criminal justice issues. It has 50, 430 square foot houses arranged in clusters around a large green and a 4,000 square foot community center that you can see where my uh, cursor is moving. Each unit has a kitchen, bathroom, and porch. And the architects, uh, BC Workshop, and, and actually one of their principals, Omar Hakim, was one of our expert uh, visitors who came to campus and worked with students. Um, they designed the site to provide three scales of public space for flexible programming and resident interaction. The large green you see here are for community events. Then there were smaller greens between units, and these are more for uh, neighborhood spaces. And then lastly, there were the porches that you see in the photo on the upper right which is uh, the, uh, the semi-public space with each, uh, for each unit. And then here's another one. This is the Veterans Community Project, a veteran-led project in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, where ultimately there will be 50, 240 square foot units arranged in clusters around common courtyards to serve only veterans. And each resident uh, will be assigned a case manager, and the village will provide a food pantry, job training, financial assistance, clothing, free bus passes, and free legal services. So lessons from the students' research inform their designs, um, you know, as well as the important elements of microhousing that Terry has over already outlined and the San Francisco. Sanford School uh, research. Uh, here's one of the students' projects on the, on the Durham site. Uh, and in this project, units were arranged around courtyards and community spaces like the Dallas project I've just, uh, I've just outlined. And that the common house included a branch library. And we learned that living with other veterans is an important component. The military is often described as a second family 
where selfless service to the nation and others provides a sense of community and shared purpose. For veterans, microhouse villages can provide permanent, affordable homes that offer the privacy of single units, but in communities of other veterans, and with the specialized supported services that many need, deserve, and are qualified for. We took the attitude that uh, small units should be compensated by generous community spaces. And in this project, uh, you have a common house that's shown here on the left here, shown in the plan right there, that has kitchen and dining, case management rooms, conference and meeting rooms, laundry and mail room. And then the site itself had a range of amenities from walking paths to meditation gardens, fire pits, and so forth. We also looked at community interfaces. This project in the Durham site included, where the cursor is moving here, a community farm and a, and, a, and a farm to table restaurant that would provide employment for the uh, veterans that live there. Throughout sustainable practices in terms of site design and building design also informed the students' work. The units themselves were designed uh, to be square footage poor, but spatially rich and adaptable throughout the day with tables that fold up to adapt rooms according to uses throughout the day. And then we looked at uh, a conventional buildings, uh, uh, materials and assemblies for cost control for you know, contractor built or volunteer built projects. And always uh, keeping in mind the balancing of community and privacy. These are small units. We tried to uh, uh, get you know, a, a, a sufficient number of units on each site. So we uh, needed to the students need to engage you know, skillfully how to do that. Here's a bedroom with beautiful, you know, that opens up spatially to a garden but has a privacy uh, fence. Just simple little moves like that. And throughout, knowing that the most important thing is to make it a home. So throughout, it was the desire to make it, you know, make it a home, recognizing that micro villages are a response to the recognition that most desire to live in a place they can call their own and that provides a mix of security, privacy and community. The desire for home to be at home is a perennial human need. So you can find the full report and other project outcomes on the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities website. You can also find the video there, which I will now conclude with. Home is our hub. Being at home is so important to our sense of self-worth and dignity. Each year, communities around our state do what's called a point in time count of the homeless population. It's like a snapshot of the way homelessness looks on any given night in North Carolina. In 2018, there were 801 identified homeless veterans in North Carolina. That's who's experiencing homelessness that night. The number of veterans who actually experience homelessness over the course of a year is closer to about 2,400. When I finally came to grips with the fact that I was, in fact, homeless, um, it was a very, very troubling time for me. I joined the Army in February 2001 as an airborne infantryman. Uh, during my six years of service, I deployed three times to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, was stationed in Korea for a year and Germany for three years. Uh, I had a lot of expectations about what life would be after the military, and quite frankly, none of them were true. That's when the 2008 market crash happened, and uh, everything really kind of came tumbling down. You know, when you, when you look at everything you own right in front of you, and, and that's it, no matter hard, how hard you worked in the past, the money you had, the things that you had, when it's 
you can literally count it almost on your fingers. It really puts things into perspective and I lost it all. The majority of the veterans that are homeless aren't homeless because that's what they want to be. They're homeless because socially they've hit a roadblock. Once I heard the numbers, that inspired me to uh, do my part to do whatever I, I can. We were approached by Terry Oliba to provide research and design ideas for veteran homelessness. They asked if we could envision micro housing villages. And these are collections of small independent living units and how they might be built. We don't want to be pitied. We're not looking for handouts even when we desperately need them. What we're really looking for is a hand up. What we need to successfully house veterans as well as all those who are experiencing homelessness is access to decent affordable housing. We're going to take the work and the studies done by the students here at the school to create two plans. The housing part is something that we could do and, and there was a, a need there so I wanted to do what we could. This was a project that was run as a graduate design studio. As a result, we ended up in the studio with some very talented students. They want to make this world a better place in ways that the built environment has very special roles to play. A micro home is a condensed version of a single family home. But outside of that, all the remaining functions are there. It is going to provide uh, permanent housing for veterans who have experienced homelessness. It's going to be designed in such a way that it's an asset both to how the community looks and feels, but how the community thinks about itself. Being a part of a community uh, is, is incredibly vital because having that community uh, really helps people kind of stay right. And I think microhousing uh, can, can help considerably. There is a deep abiding interest in veterans who might be experiencing homelessness, those who have served our country. It does not rest well with anyone that that man or woman or their families would be rendered homeless. So let's do something. I think it's easy to make the connection with a veteran because you know what they've done. They've sacrificed a certain portion of their lives. I think the beneficiaries of a microhome project like this are everybody in the community. So the, the, the outlook is we're doing good work and we've actually learned what works and we know what to do. And certainly with uh, veterans homelessness, what we've seen is when there's political will as well as increased resources and existing know-how, we can make tremendous strides forward. So if you're truly passionate about it, be the change. Help personally. Helping a vet homeless veteran get himself out of his own problems uh, is one of the best uh, pieces of advice I can give anybody that's focused on this community. That's it. You're, you're up, Kava. Thank you. Let's see. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Tom and Terry. That was awesome. Um, thank you, Melissa and Sharon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'll keep mine quick and um, give enough time, um, at least 15 minutes, for questions and any comments and things like that. So I'll get started. My name is Tava Mahadevan. I um, want to first go ahead and acknowledge um, some of our funding partners, the Triangle Community Foundation, um, um, Felix Harvey Award, that's a Chancellor's Award uh, for Innovations through UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Cardinal Innovations is our managed care organization, MCO partner, 
And Oak Foundation is an international foundation based in Geneva, Switzerland. But um, we were one of the lucky ones to get a million dollar grant, <laughs> which I'm so happy and thrilled about. Um, Chatham County Housing Trust Fund has been an awesome partner in terms of helping us with uh, some of our infrastructure development. Um, so um, we, um, the, the group that we mainly work with, these are folks with serious and persistent mental illness, like schizophrenia, um, uh, bipolar disorder, um, major mental illnesses, and co-occurring substance abuse conditions. Um, I would say about 20% of them, 15 to 20% are veterans, um, also come, um, several of them have chronic health conditions. Um, and unfortunately, our, our, our um, service system is extremely fragmented. Um, the funding system is extremely inflexible. We have workforce shortages, um, lack and as we all know, lack of safe and affordable housing, employment opportunities. Um, just poverty alone um, is a huge challenge. Um, and um, the, the, this is really staggering. Over $200 billion dollars um, um, is what we end up um, spending in terms of loss, in terms of um, a major mental illness. Um, people really, unfortunately, develop a lot of chronic medical conditions when their mental illness is not well taken care of. And to me, this, this has sort of etched in my mind and really helps me with my work. People with mental illness die 25 years younger than someone without a major mental illness. And it is preventable. It's unbelievably preventable and it's unbelievable number. To me, that is, that's, um, it, it's, um, it's something that we can make a huge impact in. And then um, veteran suicide, close to 18 to 20 veterans die by suicide every day. Uh, it's really unfortunate. Um, so I, um, I work for a center within the UNC School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, called the Center for Excellence in Community Mental Health. We provide training, technical assistance. Um, but I think to me, the main passion is we also actually do hands-on work and um, do the demonstration project where it is not just teaching and um, you know, um, lecturing, but also making sure that we are on the ground doing things, understanding what works, what doesn't work, and trying to make a difference. Um, I also, um, I have a, a, a volunteer executive director of a nonprofit that I started several years ago as part of the mental health reform, mainly working with integrating people with chronic mental health conditions, substance abuse disorders, um, and, and other health conditions, where we are integrating all the services and focusing not just on our traditional services, but looking at what we call social determinants of health, which are looking at housing, employment, food insecurity, those kinds of things, which by the way, uh, there's so much research out now shows that over 70% of somebody's health outcomes are based on those non-medical factors and less than 30% on our traditional medicine. So that was one of our main reasons to focus on that. Um, here is a, this is a, um, a again, a very eye-opening article that um, came out of uh, um, TAC, um, Technical Assistance Center. We work with mostly people who live with fixed income, um, seven, roughly about $750 a month. Um, and as you know, in the triangle, um, if we can barely rent a room for $800, please let me know. I have plenty of people <laughs> who would like to rent. Um, it is a huge issue. Every single state has the same issue. So that's what really prompted us. Um, and by no means we are in, in any way housing experts. Um, it was this sort of project, the Tiny Home Village project, came out of desperation for us. So essentially, how do you help someone live within $750 a month? Again, looking at a third of their income as um, um, essentially looking at about $250 to $260. We do know there is an uh, evidence-based practice called <clears throat> um, permanent supportive housing that works, that is providing the supports, but where do you find that affordable housing to come up with that solution? Um, so we stumbled into, um, again, by watching TV, um, uh, the Tiny Home Nation show. <laughs> um, loved it. Um, 
great to see lots and lots of uh, people interested in tiny homes, but how do you really do them? I mean, they are nice and cute on wheels, uh, but you, um, my, I remember my first discussion with Chatham County Zoning Department. Um, there is no way we can just build tiny homes on wheels and just park them where we want to. Um, so in terms of permanent supportive housing, we, need, we needed a whole new project so, um, or a different way of looking at things. Um, um, I'm going to go a little fast. So what we did was we um, worked with a group of um, Chatham County local nonprofits. Um, I don't know if you can see the picture on the side. There is a bunch of um, stakeholders who came together with our nonprofit and we were able to work with Chatham County um, planning department and zoning department and uh, build a 336 square feet tiny home um, at the Chatham County Fair as a demonstration project in partnership with Chatham Habitat for Humanity. It was a big deal for us. We didn't put a lot of um, emphasis at that point into kind of thinking through what works, what doesn't work, but we just wanted to go ahead and build something. And then, because I, I, we felt like without building something and actually being able to feel it, like, you know, how does it feel to be in a tiny home, we wouldn't be able to do anything uh, further. So this is the model tiny home. It's at the farm at Penny Lane. Um, here is the interior kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, as I said, it's 336 square feet. We had um, a group of stakeholders, um, clients that we work with who came and spent um, um, two, three um, days and gave us a lot more feedback that was in partnership with the UNC School of Social Work. And this, um, this words, um, the sentence here, tiny homes are huge. That came from every single person pretty much saying, this, this is not tiny for us, this is huge. If this is $250, a third of my rent, I'm gonna have $500 left. So we decided to um, come up with the challenge of building $50,000 is what sort of our goal was uh, to build these homes, um, which would be roughly about, um, again, uh, renting it out for $250 a month. It's based at the, the site that is the farm at Penny Lane. Um, we wanted to make sure, again, this came up again and again from our clients, uh, we need to be able to have the, the community needs to be rich in resources and really promoting well-being. Um, the farm at Penny Lane is a special place. I would love to invite you if you ever had a chance to come visit. Would love to invite you. It's a therapeutic organic farm that's Prince, um, a rooster. And um, we, we have several activities going on at the farm. Uh, we also have a pause program at the farm, really trying to bring in non-medical drivers of health. This program is a, it's sort of our ambassador program. We bring in um, shelter dogs um, from the Chatham County Shelter. Unfortunately, it's a kill shelter, but every dog that comes in is a safe dog. We are able to train the dogs, our clients. So again, working on the stigma with our clients, they are trainers when they come in, and then the dogs get adopted by UNC students, the community, or even some of our clients. It's unbelievably therapeutic for their mental health. Um, this is sort of the overall layout. Um, we have um, um, an integrated health team that's based there called the ACT team. Uh, we have a bed and breakfast that's out there. Our plan is to be able to build 15 tiny homes. Um, each one is about um, 400 square feet. It'll come with a, um, a, 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 a outdoor pavilion as well as a clubhouse like what Terry was talking about, and that was one of those main things that we wanted to focus on having a common um, area with a common kitchen as needed. Um, would, and and it, it is not mandatory, it is for people's um, interest. If they chose to get together, they could um, use that as a place. This is sort of our design team. Um, Amy Wilson um, is my um, um, co-partner in the project uh, through School of Social Work, working on the research aspect of it. Um, Lee Bowman, some of you may know Lee Bowman. Um, he, um, he, he's our project manager. He was the project manager for um, um, Newland communities um, right there, Briar Chapel area. Um, so he's working with us. Uh, we've got Michael Fioko, who is our um, um, engineer with civil consultants. Um, 
and we've got Taylor Hobbs, who's our architect, working together. Uh, we put up a master plan, got it approved through the county. Uh, we have all the um, entitlements right now, all the um, um, zoning planning, um, all, all of those work has happened. Uh, we have the permits now, and we have actually started to work on the design part of it. These are some of the homes. We have three different concepts. We are still working on these right now. Um, here is the, the clubhouse, which comes with a great room, a big kitchen, an exercise area, laundry facilities, um, and a big dining area as needed. Um, part of our, uh, we, we, um, um, getting ready with our initial phase, uh, what we call horizontal construction, we have just begun that and have cleared the five acres of land that needs to be cleared will be done by the end of the year. And this is truly a public-private partnership, um, um, involves uh, the smaller nonprofit and larger the university system, and also several um, faith-based groups, churches in the local area and the county. And uh, our hope is to make this into a demonstration project um, and be able to replicate this. And we hope to build the homes sometime in, um, early spring of 2021 and for the residents to be able to uh, be able to move in sometime in the fall and it will have a strong research um, 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 component to this one that we want to really study uh, by no means we are experts but we really want to study once residents have moved in um, and be able to be able to replicate this in other places thank you Thank you so much, Terry, Tom, Bava. We really, I can't say enough. I mean, really, Melissa and I were sitting there October 8th a year ago, and I get more from this each and every time. Um, this is being recorded, so we'll all have a chance to look back at all of this. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come into chat. Um, the first being, do in North Carolina building codes support building permanent tiny homes? I know Raleigh has a, um, you know, they have in their zoning code uh, uh, cottage courts, uh, which is another word for, for tiny home uh, villages. I believe Durham has a similar ordinance, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but it'd be easy to find out. And our homes in Chatham County, uh, they are all um, they need code. They are about 400 square feet. Um, so Chatham County is yes. Just to make sure they're on permanent, but they're on permanent foundation, not on wheels. Uh, and that's a big difference for meeting code per the question. And, and yes, in, in Durham, the, the, those the same cottage style has been passed and, and, um, uh, so. Uh, Tav is putting this into action in a great way. And I see a second follow-up question, where in Chatham County? And it is, um, it is, it is about eight miles from um, UNC hospitals um, off of 15501 Taylor Road. Um, our, uh, the farm, our property borders Briar Chapel. If you know where Briar Chapel is, um, it's right next to Briar Chapel. Um, it's about a, a mile from Farrington Village. That's another landmark um, before you get to Farrington Village. So the, one thing I should probably clarify is that uh, when Tom picked three sites to work with, these were three sites that had the potential uh, to be developed. Uh, none of them have currently. Uh, the site in, in Durham is, is a site owned by the Housing Authority, which they have identified that this would be a good use there. Uh, and, and they uh, envisioned that the small homes, the micro homes would be a part perhaps of a larger development on, on land that they have. Things were moving along and COVID-19 intervened and those conversations have, have slowed way down at this point. Uh, but still very much on the, on the, uh, in the view. So in chat, there was another question, and I'm, I'm looking for hands also that are up. Um, question in chat, and then I'm going to call on Jeremy. 
um, where is the project in Durham located? Yeah, that's what I was just saying. It's it, it's okay, a it. project in East Durham on land that's owned by the housing Durham Housing Authority. I wasn't sure if that if she was for, for that after. Jeremy, you had a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's for the professors. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for coming and talking to us. It gives me great solace to hear the power the powerhouse of our academia tackling social justice issues. So thank you for that. Um, my question for you, Professor Al well, I'll start with Professor Mahadevan. You noted that, would you say that mental health and homelessness then are interconnected? And as I was listening to your presentation, I have a, my friend and I were going to North Hills and we have our siblings, our brothers and sisters are homeless and say like former veterans. And he noted that he doesn't understand why that is a reality for our country. And so for you to, to share what you said was mind blowing for me, so. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 let me take myself as an example. I, I, um, I am a formerly homeless person. Um, I um, unfortunately ended up um, from a country called Sri Lanka, um, a, a huge ethnic conflict, um, ethnic cleansing, one of the lucky ones to get out alive. Um, getting out of there um, and ending up homeless for about two years. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, when you are homeless, I mean, you are so vulnerable to all kinds of mental health conditions. I mean, you know, you know most people are, I mean, again, we all have protective factors, but um, the, the fact that, you know, stress can really bring out things that if you are predisposed to it, you know, if things are going well, um, you know, it's fine, but but when you are under a lot of stress, those kinds of things can really push you to develop mental illness. And the other way around too, when, when people, um, you know, unfortunately develop mental illness, um, it, it is, you know, some, the symptoms of mental illness and some of the issues around mental illness, uh, it, it is really hard for people to get motivated sometimes when you are actively trying to figure out if you are hearing voices or if you are seeing things. Um, you're really trying to kind of, you know, sort of take care of the basics for yourself. It's really hard to hold the job. So unfortunately, you are pushed into poverty unless you are growing up, you know, with a wealthy family. So unfortunately, what we see is several of our clients who are mental, uh, who have a mental illness. Uh, I'm not saying mental illness doesn't mean, you know, you are sort of doomed to be homeless. But we have unbelievable stories of survival and courage and people have pull themselves out uh, with supports. But unfortunately, the reality is without enough resources, you know, we see so many folks pushed into homelessness. Um, so um, that's one area we feel like, I think for the first time, I'm very pleased to say in the triangle, and it's really nice to see Tom from NC State and Terry from Duke, and I'm with UNC. I'm working with Wake Med right now. Um, and with Duke Hospital in terms of a partnership to start to look at housing as healthcare, how housing plays a big role, um, like I, I was mentioning earlier, in terms of social determinants, it, I mean, more than the traditional medicine from pharmaceuticals to formalized therapy, that's, that counts for less than 30% of somebody's health outcomes, over 70% are uh, based on those non-medical drivers of health. So things like, you know, affordable housing or a place where someone can live um, in a permanent place, not just temporarily moving from place to place, having a job, having, you know, good relationships with people, um, having access to good healthy food, all of those things counts for more than 70%. And I think the larger healthcare systems are recognizing those things more and more now. Um, you know, in a, in a more of a selfish way, it also keeps the cost down too. If we can help people to live uh, uh, by using these preventive measures, which housing is a big part, then you don't have to have catch people at the back end at the emergency room or in inpatient hospitals where we'll be and we are spending a lot more money and taking care of folks. So, um, yes, hope, sir. hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you, sir. And Madam Chair, I have two other questions and okay. I know I'm mindful of the time. For Professor Alaba and uh, Professor Barry, has so affordable housing is a great concern for our association, um, and so when 
we're having, I'm in Raleigh, and so the city of Raleigh is having an affordable housing discourse. My question is, has the city manager reached out to the powerhouse of academia and say, what can we do better? And my second question is, as realtors, what can we do to help the cause of justice for affordable housing? Okay, so, well, I can speak, you know, to Raleigh uh, in terms of, you know, interactions with the city. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, it's, uh, it's infrequent that we get requests uh, for service from, from municipalities or municipal leaders. Um, but we're, we're always delighted and try to respond when we can. Um, Sharon mentioned earlier that I had done some work on on uh, getting a, a accessory dwelling units approved in the city of Raleigh, and that actually began as a uh, as a request from the uh, Sid, uh, Raleigh City's Urban Design Center, as Grant Miachi was running. Because what had happened is that uh, in the Unified Development Ordinance process that was completed in 2013. Uh, ADUs were included, but at the 11th hour got taken out. Hmm. So uh, Grant came to me and said, can you guys run a project and try to restart this project? And so that's what we, we did in uh, 2014. And that just turned into a seven, six, seven year advocacy effort, uh, working with city folks, in, including uh, our you know, mayor, uh, Marianne Baldwin, uh, was was part of those efforts and uh, and uh, including also working for candidates who got elected to city council and so we were delighted that at their very first meeting one of their uh, immediate goals was to approve a ADU ordinance um, which uh, I offered some input on to the planning commission and uh, we now have one of the better ADU ordinances I would say in the country. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. So in terms of Durham, our mayor, Steve Shul, uh, ran on a housing, affordable housing campaign was his primary issue. He has also uh, has been a professor at the, at the Sanford School of Public Policy for many years, and so has been a part of threading that connection between students and doing their studies and what's happening in Durham. So those public policy students are fanned out across the city with various organizations. In addition to that, voters passed a $95 million affordable housing bond issue that I think helped to spurn uh, Wake and Raleigh towards some of the same uh, in, in terms of seeing the need. And it's just, it's something that it, that is now the, 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 the resources, putting resources toward this affordable housing work is just seen as essential to the to the health and well-being of our whole cities, not just for those who are uh, needing affordable housing, but the health and well-being of our whole city. So I, I think there's a lot of progress, but it's a big issue, as you say, as you know, Jeremy. So I, I appreciate your interest in in that. Yeah, and I would say, uh, you know, for what realtors can do, I mean, from a professor's point of view, uh, you know, we don't build things the way Terry. And Tava do uh, we 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 you know we try to engage in in areas of education and, and advocacy and I think you know a realtors association could could certainly be engaged in similar ways. Thank you, professors. Thank you for the good and necessary work you all do. Thank you. So there's a question in chat: Are municipal concessions being made on setbacks? I, you know, I, I, uh, I think that certainly in Raleigh, um, there is, we have a planning commission now that is looking at, uh, uh, you know, different avenues to, uh, to, to be able to, you know, increase the, uh, the stock of, of, uh, you know, of affordable housing. I, I, I know the ADU one most, so I can cite that, that when that, final ordinance was being planned, uh, they worked very hard to, to make it so that, um, you know, conforming lots, you know, would be able to uh, have ADUs built on them. Um, 
The next thing they should do is to increase that to make non-conforming lots uh, uh, conforming. Uh, City of Asheville has done that. So you actually are increasing the number of properties that can build uh, these, uh, you know, these these additional housing. Thank you. And then Tim at Greer had a question, and then we'll go to Andrew Sims. Yeah, my question is, um, there are shipping containers that are available. You can buy them for about $4,000. They're 40 feet long. You can buy different lengths, but I'm just thinking of the one that's 40 foot. I think they're eight feet wide. Has there any been any thought about combining those, stacking those, using those as the foundation from which you then add the plumbing, the electrical, the insulation, all that, but at least you have the actual framing of the, of the unit and, and you can make them as small or as large as you want. Have, has anyone here looked into that possibility? Uh, yeah, I can share that. That's been a popular uh, subject in schools of architecture for quite some time. And there has, uh, there have been um, uh, certainly multifamily housing uh, built uh, using shipping containers. Uh, honestly, the jury's still out as to whether uh, they are more cost efficient. Uh, than you know, conventional uh, construction, and uh, certainly I know uh, you know from experience and working with students uh, that the um, eight foot four and a quarter, I think it is, uh, width of of these is is quite difficult to work with in terms of housing. Andrew Sims, you had a question. Yeah, thank you, Sharon, and um, thank you the, to our panelists. It was a very good topic, very good conversation, and appreciate the, the insights and knowledge. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, one of the things that is important, obviously, to our association and has been for a while and uh, is a part of our strategic plan is how do we fit into the conversation as an industry, as a profession to affordable housing. Um, and recently, our strategic planning committee met and had a conversation that the most important role that we feel we can play is providing important data. Um, and as academics, uh, you know that that data is important and essential as you uh, formulate positions and opinions and, and, and all these um, research points that you're making. I guess my question to you all is as a partner, because that's obviously what we want to be in this conversation, what data is important to you all? What data can we as industry professionals as, and as an organization provide to you all or assist in through grants or through research ourselves, um, that would be of interest to me to know what data is important to you all. Tom or Terry. <laughs> so I think to me, I'm, I'm not a researcher, um, um, I'm a clinician. Um, so I think the data that has been extremely useful for us is the end user data. So um, essentially um, we serve about 2000 people in the triangle area with um, serious health conditions uh, through our center. So the data from our clients around you know, um, limitations, the data that um, it, it, what we are able to gather, which is being currently done through School of Social Work, but um, that is a brand new project that I mentioned to Tom and Terry yesterday, and I think your group could be a very valuable partner in that. It's a new project through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Wake County just got a big grant that we will be partnering to work with. It's called um, Family of Faces Project that um, um, it not only looks at housing, but looks at many, many aspects of folks who are cycling through hospitals and jails and prisons and different places. SAS is going to be a partner with that too, but um, there is a lot of momentum in terms of pulling in pretty much every stakeholder in Wake County to look at um, sort of tackling that issue of the group of clients or patients or people who are moving from systems to systems costing an enormous amount of money and the suffering that goes on with it for those folks and their families. And housing is going to play a big role 
the county manager's office is going to be coordinating that and i'm happy to share more details with you as we develop it just got funded as of October 1, would love to kind of sit down with you and maybe do some planning. Uh, it's a three-year project, so would love to connect with you uh, maybe in the coming days and weeks to plan for that one, if that would be uh, helpful. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, the, the work that, you know, we do over at the College of Design, you know, mostly we're not, you know, we're not involved in, in data collection in terms of policy and so forth. We, we just don't do that kind of work. Um, and, but for me, uh, it's using data uh, in a you know in an impactful way, uh, data that 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 people can understand. And I'll just share with you: we ran a project last fall that was uh, focused on affordable and supportive housing for North Carolina State University students, and we took that on and are still engaged. around this uh, because of some very compelling evidence that came out of a data collection exercise which was a, uh, a very rigorous survey that was administered to NC State students uh, around food and housing and security and one of the outcomes of that or a very compelling one which you know we found really hit home was one out of ten uh, in other words 10% uh, of the respondents said that they had experienced some form of homelessness in the past year. We have a student population of 36,000 students. Wow. So uh, one thing that I'll add uh, to what Tom and Tom have said is that, you know, since our work, uh, all, it, both Tom and I's and what we've been referencing uh, is concerning with uh, people who are seeking to move out of homelessness it is almost always a rental situation that we're talking about. And we're talking about creating a more uh, affordable housing while creating supports that, that enhance that access. So I don't know how many of you all are involved in, in uh, being realtors for you know, apartment buildings or rental situations or houses that are rentals are if you're more focused on home ownership. But I know in that realm, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks about the work I did with the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, we had there's there's an ongoing project to look to see how enhancements with landlords uh, will encourage uh, renting to folks that that have trouble getting the housing. How do we help create access on 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 the on the user side? Um, and, and, and so that data about what gets in the way, how many people are retaining their housing, how, how you all are seeing uh, the response to the eviction crisis that you know, we're facing now, and, and there's a moratorium on that. But when that is loosened, uh, what happens to people that are in that housing? So that, that's the kind of meat of stuff that, most interest, that, that is most, most in my line of interest. But I'm not sure it is in your all, so I, I say that and, and I'll stop. Andrew? Yeah, so, so, so I appreciate, I definitely appreciate those answers. I think one of the roadblocks to getting involved is knowing how to get involved. And um, obviously, Tava, your invitation is well received and uh, accepted. Um, I, I think we, we would love to be a part of those conversations and part of those studies because I think arguably, um, and I'll, I'll kind of follow up almost a little anecdotally here, that when I've been involved with um, revitalization and affordable housing projects in the past in this industry, um, a lot of times it's sought around um, where are neighborhoods where this type of work should be being done. And how do you study locations where this type of work should be done, whether that's improving existing housing stock in neighborhoods, because that's the other piece of this conversation is that while yes, new builds and new housing stock is, is something that can be talked about. Um, we have existing inventory now that is not livable. 
Um, and there's some studies that have been done down in Mobile that I can share with you. Uh, and there's some other studies that have been done about when you when you take back inventory in neighborhoods that some people would consider blighted uh, and then turn that into, as you say, attainable and um, accessible housing, um, that's an important metric to have. And it's an important metric for a community to have. So when, when I've worked on these projects before, we've looked at tipping point communities where foreclosure rates have, you know, pre and post recession made big movement. And then post recession, you have neighborhoods that have bounced back as people have moved back into these communities, but you have neighborhoods that have not bounced back. So then the data is able to say, okay, well, that's clearly where we need to go and work. And I say this um, a little bit uh, ambivalent as we're fixing to launch into a very big affordable housing bond um, that I think this is important data and important study that we need to do here in the Raleigh area to know where these monies and these funds can really be effectively uh, utilized and used. So again, I, I think my question and Tava, you kind of hit on it and maybe that's our starting point to figure out how we can get further involved. Um, but we have access to a lot of that data. We, we study that, we have systems that study that and we'd be remiss to the conversation if we didn't try to plug that in and be a part of that. So appreciate that. Uh, Andrew, have you spoken to other realtors groups, uh, you know, around the country? About this, yes, uh, and and it's you know I I was served as the CEO of the association in Dayton, Ohio, which if you know anything about Dayton, Ohio, is uh, a rough uh, you know a community that suffered during the recession um, when General Motors and you know a lot of the automobile industry moved out, um, a lot of people fled some of these midwestern towns, uh, and Dayton had to kind of overnight reinvent itself uh, in a very non blue collar way with a very blue collar um, population. And so we did a lot of work with the Dayton Home Ownership Center as an association to do some GIS mapping and some other modeling projects to say, okay, these communities, they're areas we should put money in. Um, and we kind of took that study as a showcase for how a realtor association, which kind of usually gets lumped in with commission, 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 sell, 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 uh, and turned it into, as you said, an advocacy mission where we truly are about putting back into that the community. But I think it differs from place to place, but I think the principle of the relationship sits no matter where you are geographically. That's great. I think that's, that's where I usually start is what's going on in other cities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would love to connect with you, Andrew. Well, we'll, we'll make it happen, my friend. Perfect, thanks. Madam Chair, may I please ask um, a quick question? Becky, uh, Becky has a question first. Yes, Becky, go ahead. So um, um, I'm interested in the, your village concepts and the tiny houses because it seems to me to make housing affordable in the urban areas, the problem really isn't the cost of the two by fours or the cost of the construction. It's really the cost of the land and the availability of the land. And so isn't, um, I mean, I have always thought that a big part of that answer had to be density, that we had to go up, not out. And your concept, I mean, your village in Chatham County is lovely, but it's miles away from a grocery store. There's no public transportation. Um, how are these people going to, I mean, they're, they're gonna have to have cars, which if they're in that stage of life, they probably don't, can't afford a car either. So I'm, I'm although they're very picturesque, I'm, I'm just wondering how that practically addresses the needs of people who need not just a house, but access to, to things. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Comes up all the time, especially transportation is such a challenge. Um, Becky, I don't know if you've been recently to that area. Um, the, um, we now have a community college, Central Carolina Community College Medical Campus is uh, built right across Penny Lane. And we have the bus line coming there. 
and I have been working with every single county commissioner, invited them in. You know, sometimes you have to build it because it's not there. Well, <laughs> so, you know, I've been on their case for the last three years and they are very supportive. We have assurance from the commissioners and uh, what we will have is once the village is built, Chatham Transit will be coming straight into the village. They will be coming to the community college now and then Chatham Transit connects to Southern Village in Chapel Hill. So then they will connect from Southern Village through the free public transportation system of the Chapel Hill Carvero um, um, bus system. So, so yeah, so that's a very good question, Becky. And th that is what we are working on. And we are very pleased to say that the commissioners are very supportive and Chatham Transit is going to be bringing uh, Chatham Transit line right through um, the, the village. So. So that's sort of the transportation thing. I, and I think you're right. I think, um, you know, partly we sort of came from the healthcare side of things and approaching this to kind of figure out. And one of the issues that kept coming again and again is living in apartment complexes, living in places where the walls are very thin, especially for someone with a serious mental illness who's, you know, having trouble with like voices sometimes and just having a hard time managing symptoms. It is a little harder. So, um, so, so again, this doesn't solve all of the housing issues, but for a group of people who would like their own space, feel like that's their home that they want to be in, but not really connected right next to each other's, I think this will be a good model, but, but certainly this will not solve all of the issues. This will be probably one of many we will have to think about. And mainly this would be a really good rural model that we are building in Chatham. Um, so I think maybe Tom and Terry may be the experts in urban type of models. Yeah, as, as we looked at the, it's a great question and it's a great observation because I think it's critical and, and Tom has hit on, uh, I, I think, some key points and that is this is not the solution. This is a part of a community's uh, uh, response to the challenges of homelessness, mental illness, uh, the lack of affordable housing. So there are times in those urban areas uh, where there's limited space, it would be a better idea in terms of housing uh, to go up, just like you say. Uh, there are possibilities that emerge when you have a larger footprint, such as the one Durham footprint, where there's the option of doing uh, both. And it could be that uh, uh, toward Tava's point, that as affordable housing, uh, um, projects move forward that they had some combination, both of apartments and a micro housing village within that. It doesn't have to be either or, and certainly should not be seen as the solution to our affordable housing. And we were, we are most, in, when we were working on, we were most interested in the rural applications uh, because of the very things that you mentioned. So uh, Tava's project it becomes really critical in that and how you address uh, the transportation and service issues. So great, great question. Thank you. We have a brief question from Jeremy and then um, I think we'll pretty quickly wrap it up. We have a little bit of- I'll be quick. Oh, yes, ma'am. Maybe there's no answer to my question, but I'm 28 <laughs> Professor Alaba and Barry and Madiba. But was this not a concern back in the day? And it just baffles my mind for the, we have the strongest economy in the world and the richest country, and yet it's a concern. And I just don't understand. Uh, yeah, I just don't understand why this is the case. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just. It makes I, our head explode. <laughs> I apologize. It's, it's, like, it's, oh my uh, goodness! Uh, it, what it, were people doing back in the day? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Madam Chair. Or the I'm looking to see if there are any other very brief questions, but I'm not seeing anything from anybody. I may want to just briefly answer Jeremy. So Jeremy, I think you know I, th I don't think we can give up. I know I know it's it's really in terms of like looking at I mean you know we spend more money than any other industrialized country in health, but when you look at health outcomes, we are way at the bottom. However, I mean I would say the 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 I mean, in North Carolina, especially now the, the triangle area, you know, regardless of politics and regardless of everything, that is a heightened recognition to kind of really look at 
things outside of our traditional medical system and mm. um, you know really starting to look at wellness i mean it doesn't have to be when you're you know it's a college student like what uh, tom was saying who could be homeless it, it is it is a veteran it, it is i mean i have kids just graduating college i mean for them to be able to buy a house that's affordable and you know pay a mortgage and think about this so i mean there are so many different groups so I think that is a movement and a momentum um, to kind of really look at wellness and prevention as a way of um, kind of you know living healthy. So I feel like, uh, I think we are in the right place in the triangle. And I feel like we need to be able to bring in more non-traditional partners like you and you know, realtors, um, faith-based groups, civic groups to kind of solve this common problem. And I, I'm very hopeful, I just want to let you know. <laughs> Thank you. So, so there have been two things that have, three actually, that have come into chat to me. Um, and again, this may involve a little bit more, but I, I think we all need to keep, keep talking because you three are just so remarkable. Um, are, there current, are there currently funds available to acquire land for future projects like these we should know about in case we come across privately owned land that may not have value for market rate development? And the other was, can you ask the guests if anyone at the local or state level has offered to provide a list of unused public land that might be available? Um, inexpensive compared to normal market costs. I believe there are a number of parcels that are not used. I, I think where they're going, you know, we as it, working in the community, there are many times that uh, we have clients or, or know of people that have a track of land. And it just isn't something that, uh, there, there may be more value and there may be more incentive on that owner's part to do something with you all. How does that piece together? What do we need to do to bring those to your attention? Or is there some kind of entity that would be good with that? And Martin, did I see your hand up? Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just waving at someone walking by. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's Terry Thomas. Go ahead. <laughs> So, so I think the, the way that, 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 that we hope that this study would do is to build awareness of the realities that you can do micro housing uh, for veterans, for people with mental illness, for people moving out of homelessness, to build that awareness and that model in the consciousness of those who are making decisions. Both I, Durham, I know, has exhaustive list of available land, both publicly owned land, uh, and I assume that Wake has developed that as well. But at the, you know, city's community development department, um, really, it needs to be promoted there that this is an, you know, we're trying to promote that as an option. Um, and there's not currently a fund that you go to to get money to buy that, but so that developing land for micro housing is seen as a viable thing to do that meets code and all those sorts of things is something that we are in the midst of trying to develop that that knowledge and that awareness and that commitment so it's not there yet we're you know this is part of the process sharon there may be some opportunities again i'm coming from the health side of things there is a lot of recognition from the healthcare side of things which has some you know significant resources and um, they may be like for example the larger unc system maybe the wake med system maybe duke in some ways i know um, up in boston several of the hospital systems have invested in housing um, as uh, as a way of you know promoting health and preventing folks from you know moving into chronic conditions so that could be one area that we can definitely look at i see a lot of um, recognition now. Um, I also see from the payer sources, um, um, NCDHHS, Health and Human Services, um, part of the, the, the Medicaid reform plan. Uh, that is a project that uh, Wake County has applied. It's called Healthy Opportunities Pilot, $650 million set aside for the next four years to look at social determinants of health, which housing is a huge priority. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to maybe offline, I know we are running out of time, but maybe we can set up some meetings to kind of, you know, think it through. I don't think there is one clearinghouse that I can think of like what Terry was saying, but this may be something we may want to start to look around. I know the Healthy Opportunities Pilot is a big one 
that the state health and human services is wanting to promote and put money in um, to, to get started now, which is approved by the federal government, Federal Center for Medicaid, Medicare Services. That's helpful. Um, I, I, I see, I know, um, Tom, you need to teach, which we love your students and we love the fact that you teach them so much. Um, so we're gonna let you go. Um, so uh, I do want, I, there's one last question I know that Becky has, um, but I do want to, just in case you do have to peel off Tom, um, it is so fortunate to have the three of you in our community and your efforts, skill, communications with each other, with us, with the folks in this community, um, you're, you're just making a difference in so many lives. Um, I, I, I do believe, again, you're bringing talented people to this community and you're bringing us all together to help out everybody in this community. So I just, I just want to thank you so much. Um, I think we all sit here, some of us right now in our homes with these meetings, working in our homes, and, and we know we, as we help people the value of a home. And, and I think as you mentioned too, that it's a human need and, and, and you all are, you're, you're doing it and thank you. I appreciate it so much. Um, I, I know Becky, you had a quick question. Um, if it's very, very quick, um, but we do have just a little bit of business and uh, again, speakers, that's just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have to go, but I thank you for inviting us and, and, and thank you for all of your commitment to these, these, these crucial issues. And, uh, Let's keep the conversation going and see if there's opportunities that we can uh, assist each other's efforts. So Agreed. thanks again for inviting us. Thank you so much. We appreciate it so very, very much. Um, I wanted to ask about, again, some of these concepts where they're targeted to particular and, and certainly groups that have very particular needs, the, the health, you know, as you said, Thava, about the health care needs, homeless veterans. But I'm wondering if it is generally a good idea in your minds or in the work that you've seen elsewhere to group these people in communities all together rather than dispersing them through the community. Um, you know, when we think back to the visions of public housing that we all hated or that became very legitimate problems in lots of communities, isn't part of the solution to move these populations, uh, um, you know, to not group them all together. I I'm find that very troubling. Yeah, no, it's an awesome question. And I'm going to keep it. I, I can talk for an hour about this, but I'm going to keep it for like one minute. <laughs> we'll have you back for the hour. But thank you so much. That's a great question, Becky. We've, 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 we've been talking about this for a very, 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 very long time. And um, you know, one of the things that we found was, you know, back in the days, everybody was grouped, everybody was in institutions such a stigma, it was terrible. And, you know, we never ever wanted to go back to those days. And, um, you know, the, the, the best practices in doing housing is scattered site housing, like what you are talking about. People living among, you know, mental illness should not define, or healthcare should not define that person. However, my last 25 years, we, what we are finding out, and we are working with one of the well-known researchers in the in the, in, the, in the country and in the world out of Temple University, um, in terms of scattered sites housing, that what we are finding is people are lonely if they don't have the support system, especially people who are so vulnerable are lonely. And we have literally found people dead in their home because they have no support system. In the name of scattered site housing, you know, people have got placed, but unfortunately there aren't in of support systems for them and it's not you know it's nice to know that neighbors can be helpful but the reality is that has not happened to several people so so this sort of the sort of the third leg on the stool and doesn't mean this is again like what Terry and me were saying this is not the answer to all of the you know housing issue but it is a place where a group of people that's why our homes are this is this is no more than 15 is what we have here not to keep adding on and mental illness doesn't define them. This is a wellness village. Mental illness is one piece of it, 
They are in a village that already has a pause program that involves community that's in there. Community integration is a big part. Um, everyone who comes in to volunteer, nobody is identified as a patient, client, everybody is a volunteer out there. We have high schools visiting. It's also a place to talk about mental illness with someone who probably hasn't talked about. I have a group of five high, different high schools that come and volunteer there. You get to start to then talk to parents and say, you know, they start to talk about, you know, my brother has a mental illness, my sister has this chronic condition. So it's sort of become a little bit more normal to talk about, but I think you're absolutely right. We make every effort to minimize the stigma. Stigma is a big issue and we make every effort to minimize the stigma, at least where we are. That should be the main goal. We don't want to congregate people and create that, um, you know, that stigma that, that you just mentioned that we, that we have done in the past. So it is not just about putting people in housing. This is about a new concept about wellness. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but I would love to sit down and talk to you some more. Thank you, or thank you all very much. And I hate that we have to end this because this channel is unfortunately getting ready to be used by another one. Um, if there is no, uh, uh, the business, you're going to get an email from Jordan. She's going to have the business things in here. The vote will take on the next one for the minutes. But if there is no objection, then I move that we adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Nice to meet everybody. Good stuff.